All right, great. I, I think we can get going. Thank you everyone for joining another webinar hosted by the Community Action Network, an initiative of ATA. Tonight we'll be, we will delve into the significance of general valuation rules and why your active participation in the process is crucial. General valuation rules play a pivotal role in determining property taxes, which directly impact property owners and tenants alike. Every rand assigned to the total value of your property by your municipality influences your rates bill. Failure to engage in this process could obviously lead to unwarranted increases adversely affecting your cash flow. And in these days, I think that's quite critical. Multiple municipalities across the country are currently engaging in their GVRs or general valuation roles. They have to do this before June 2024 in order to finalize their 2024-2025 budgets. We at CAN are obviously tracking these, and these include municipalities such as Beaufort West, Dr. Bayes Nordea, Greater Zanin, Matatiel, Newcastle, and Oatswarden. Our discussion tonight will unravel the importance of GVRs, expose potential abuses, and equip you with the strategies to shield yourself from unjust hikes. <clears throat> All right, so we have two great speakers this evening. We've got Ben Esbach, who is the Director of Valuations at RatesWatch at a Kudalini-based business with a national footprint. And we have Micah Gohl, who is a partner at Chidna's Attorneys and who has offices in Johannesburg and now more recently Belito and Kozulu Natal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna obviously first hear what Ben ha has said from a valuer's perspective. And then we're going to turn to Micah, who's obviously going to give us the legal perspective of how to deal with this particular issue. Ben has many decades in the valuation space, having served as a former president of the South African Valuers Association. Furthermore, he was also part of the task team responsible for drafting the Municipal Property Rates Act, which I do think at another time warrants a conversation. But Ben, I think let's, let's start... Let's first start with the most important question of them all, which is probably what everyone asks when the valuation process takes place. And this is, it is the, there appears to be an inconsistency in municipal values as opposed to market values. For instance, my home was valued at 250,000 and more than its actual value was at the time. I appealed it and was successful. But in the process, I found out that all the properties on my road had been completely overvalued. And we'd all been overvalued by the exact same percentage, 15%. So one, one obviously is under, of the understanding that they do these kind of bulk valuations. But I think the, the real question here is, are municipal valuers deliberately inflating prices at the behest of a municipality in order to raise revenue? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question statement um, and uh, being a valuer I must come up with my for, for, <laughs> have to defend my my colleagues who are, are working for the municipalities and 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 I would say the valuer the aim of the valuer is is to determine the, the market value and I'll, I'll I'll expand a bit on it just now to, to give you the background as as it's it's sort of um, written or, 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 or stipulated in, in the in the rights municipal property rights act but no valuer will 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 sort of buy intentionally overvalue properties because um, first of all um he, he's got the prof professional um, he says he's a professional he should not do that so if he if he does it, it, it it's purely it's, it's a mistake or or maybe a lack of understanding so maybe before, and and, and i I should be able to shed some light on why your street was overvalued by by a, a 15 or 20 25 percent but let me just go back to the to the legislation so the basis is 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 market value but then and and that you if you read the the legislation you will read read about it in section 46 where it says and, and we all know what's market value. Um, it is where you have a willing buyer and a willing seller. But now the the NPRA um, has has included some some rules 
and the rules are more applicable to income producing properties. So there are actually no rules which which should deliver a different result if you do a valuation for rights purposes or so-called municipal valuation, or, or if you do a valuation for the property, you sell it in the market. So in, in theory, the, the, the answer should be the same. Um, the problem is, is and you've, you've, you've touched on that, we, we're referring to mass valuation. So where, where, when I do a valuation of your property, if you want to sell it, I, I, it's one one property at a time, and and there's a lot of time spent on every property. But when you do municipal valuations, it's a mass valuation exercise. Where uh, I don't know, uh, Joe Burke has got nine hundred thousand properties that must be valued in eighteen months. So so you can't do a one on one. So you need to go to mass valuation, where where they build models, um, where. And on the one on the one hand, you have the value forming attributes of the property. A residential property would be typically will be the, how big the buildings are, is there a swimming pool, uh, number of rooms. Um, that will be the the attributes from the property itself. And then the market is analyzed to to, to see what people will buy typically for a house in, in, in that area. And that then is, is then a model is built and that's fed into a model. So if that model is, is, is not adjusted correctly, you can have a whole street being overvalued by 25%. But that was not intention, definitely. They, because they should be, um, uh, at the end of the day, the municipal valuer should do quality control to, to, to prevent um, mistakes like that. Um, so I, I think that the important thing is, is, is that what, what the, the man in the street must know is that on residential property, the, the test is what is the price that, that you will accept for your property? Or what will you what what price will you be prepared to pay for that property? That that's a simple test. Um, residential properties, obviously, how do you get to the value of a residential property? Um, you, it's based on on the house, the selling prices of houses in the area, similar houses, or if or, or if the property itself sold recently, that is also a good um, indication or well, the best indication of the value. So I think I've, I've hopefully I've painted that picture on, 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 on market value and the basis of valuation. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, Ben. And obviously I know it was a, quite a question, but I think that's often what people assume that we, we want to figure out exactly why do these valuations come in the way they are. And what you were leading on to is really the basis, the, the basis of valuation, the assumptions that are used to develop the, the basis of valuations and the guiding principles. So uh, these guiding principles, as you've elaborated now, are they reviewed on a fairly regular basis and um, by perhaps like the Municipal Valuers Association? Um, there's not really a formal process um, where, where, where there's a quality control from an external party. Uh, I, I I am aware that that the municipality of Cape Town, um, and I'm, I don't know whether where where, if they did it for with the, the last general valuation that was implemented last year, um, but they on previous roles they um, asked external bodies to do a quality check, and and do sales ratio analysis and a lot of statistical analysis, and and, and but I'm not I'm not really. Um, sure that if, if other municipalities are doing that. So Ben, you know, there's just, and, and just to just to finalize on this particular point, and I think just really talking about the guiding rules and the principles and um, the, 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 the self-reviewing uh, mechanisms that are in place. If a, a member of the public, and this is before we really going to get into the kind of the other the nitty gritty about the data valuation and all these important things. But is a member of the public able to hold a municipal value account for a poor valuation? Is there a is there a mechanism that perhaps to to report them on or a somewhere else that can go besides a municipality to where they can where, where they can obviously get some kind of finality on or whether they believe the valuation is fair or not? Well, um, obviously the, the 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 objection process is one of the one of the um, tools. 
where, where you can, where if, if the property is incorrectly valued, uh, there's an avenue of, of submitting an objection and we'll, we'll deal with the objections later on. But th that's one of the, the, the tools available to the ministry. Um, if, 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 if the public feels that the municipal valuer didn't do his job and that he didn't do it professionally, obviously uh, municipal valuers are all professional valuers or professional associated values and they are registered with, with, uh, with our professional body. And you can always lay a, 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 a complaint there if, if, you, if you feel that the, the, the valuer didn't act professionally in his job. Um, yeah. But that that is another can of worms for, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to tackle. No, th thanks, Ben. Um, so I think what many of us get wrong, including myself, is the importance of the dates of valuation. My understanding is this is the valuation date in which the market value is established for a particular property. In other words, it's the price of the asset valued on a set date. Could you explain a little bit further about the importance of the dates of valuation? Okay, first of all, just, just take it back to the legislation. In, in Section 31 of the Act, it says that the date of valuation may not be more than 12 months before the valuation goal is implemented. So typically for the general valuations, the GV 2024s that we, that we have on the table now, and some of them will come a bit later, they, they, the date of valuation uh, may not be more than 12 months before the 1st of July, 2024. And typically, uh, the, the value, date of valuation is chosen as, as the, on the maximum. So, so most of these valuation goals will have a date of valuation of 1 July, 2023. So what is the importance of the date of valuation? Because uh, property values are not, it's not stagnant. They change over time, up or down or whatever, um, but it, it, it is not the same um, over time. So what 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 in the picture in your mind should be on, on the date of valuation, 1st of July 2023, you take a snapshot of what the market was like. And, and that that will then determine the market parameters that you apply. Um, so and it will also typically take a snapshot of the properties. So what what was your what was your property like? Uh, what did it look like on the 1st of July, 2023? What was the market doing a, a, around that date? And, and based on, on that, the value was determined. So um, what's important to, to keep in mind, if the market has changed afterwards, you, that, is, that, that, that is ignored. And I think a good example was when we had COVID and everybody, um, especially on the office sector, had a, had a big jump in 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 in, 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 in the in the, um, the demand for office space, and there was a was a downwards trend in in the values. That didn't trigger valuation supplementary valuations because the date of valuation was fixed. And, and remember that snapshot of the value, of the market at that date. Um, so if if you instruct a valuer to do a valuation. For, for municipal purposes, make sure you have the correct date of valuation. And that must be part of the instruction. Value my property as at the 1st of July, 2023. Um, I often see values, um, especially when, when you're in the th third or fourth year of the life of a valuation law, um, then a, 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 a client will ask for a valuation from a valuer. And if the instruction is not clear, the, the valuer will take a date close close to a later date or, a, or incorrect date to base his valuation. So keep that in mind if you instruct the valuer. So, so I think that sort of hopefully that covers the the date of valuation. So just to say it is so important to know what the date of valuation is. And then what um obviously the let's let's actually discuss let's sort of discuss the valuation role and its purpose in all of this um. Why do we need a GVR? Why do we, or general valuation, or why do we need to revalue our property every five years? Once again, I'm going to come back to this idea of the market value. Does this not, does the market not do this automatically? Could, and often we'll see GVRs coming in higher than the market. And I, and I know there's a discussion about that of when it was valued as to now what the kind of value is now. So I, I do understand that argument. 
Um, some would obviously call, some might even call the GBR anti-market because it's almost a dictated to by, by kind of a government entity and see this is what your value is and this is what we're going to charge you. But perhaps just as coming to the first part of my query there was why do we need a GBR? Why do we need to do this every four years? Sorry, not every five. Why do we need to do this every four years? Well, my, my simple answer is because the act says you must do it. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, but okay. that, that obviously doesn't doesn't add any value. So um, the, the, the NPRA um, distinguishes between metro, metropolitan um, uh, municipalities and, and the local municipalities. So the rules for metropolitan municipalities is that every five years, the maximum. So that's the maximum life. Of, of evaluation roles, role for metros. And the maximum life for evaluation role for, for the other municipalities, that's about 200 of them, the local municipalities, is seven years. Uh, but but they, it's every, anything in between. Typically, the, I see the metros opt for four years. Cape Town is on a three year cycle. Um, and if you go to the local municipalities, your, your biggest cities like, uh, Polokwane and, and Montbella and Sibuzi, um, they, they will also be on a four or five year cycle, but then your rural municipalities will, um, will opt for the, for the longer cycle. And the reason why you need to regularly revalue properties is to reflect the change in the market trends. So remember, if, if you, um, over time, um, there is a change in the value values are in, in, in any area. And some areas in the values increase more than the others. So if you if you work with old the old data valuation, you don't reflect those changes in the market. So that, that I think that is the main 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 aim to, to keep it more fair uh, fair because of the changes in the market and to reflect that in, in, in the rights paid by the different owners. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, and I, I, I always thought it was just the four years. Uh, thank you for breaking down that kind of that time period. So it's anything in between. And I'd heard of Cape Town doing it every three years. In fact, when I hear of Cape Town doing it every three years, those people are usually complaining to me that Cape Town does it every three years. Um, so and I, obviously we've got you on this, pod, uh, on this webinar. And one of the, I think we also need to understand the role of a private valuer. How your particular role, and obviously there's a, a lot of, there are valuers throughout the country that do this kind of profession, but could you give us a brief explanation of how the valuer as a private valuer, not the municipal valuer, gets involved in this process? Well, well, typically um, if, if the, the owner feels that the property, the value is incorrect and, and he, he's, he's not comfortable uh, because there's nothing preventing the owner to do his own objection, do his own estimate, est estimate of the value and, and present that as long as he's, he's, he's using the, the, the correct blocks, building blocks to, to, to come to his conclusion. Um, so, so the moment that the, the owners don't feel comfortable to do it themselves, obviously the, the value is qualified to do that. And, and uh, they, they then, uh, well, get the references from, from, from friends or, or Hopefully they they know about Rates Watch or and there are a few other companies that also specialize in, in municipal valuations. And and, and, and the, then the process starts because the valuer is trained to um, to motivate evaluation. Um, and, and that is often the lack, lacking in, in when a when a, uh, the owner does his own objection. They don't know how to motivate um, their, their, their result. And what we often see uh, is that um, they will say, okay, but the old value was, was X rand. Um, it's now five years later. CPI was 5% per year. So they added five, five years, 5% 5 every year. They say the value should be Y. But that is wrong. That is not that's not how you how you prove your your point. You need to go to the market to see what the market is prepared to pay for your property um, at on the date of valuation. Thanks, Ben. And 
I know we're kind of coming to a close of this particular segment, but you did open the door on this previous question, so I am going to walk through it. Do we need to revisit the municipal property value, municipal property rates act, and update it? It's a twenty-year-old piece of legislation. Is it still fit for purpose? Just give us your brief thoughts, thanks. Well, I, I think there are there there are areas that need to need to improve, um, and and to move with time because uh, an example. The, the act provides for the that the first fifteen thousand of a residential property is is excluded from writing, and at the time of writing, that was sort of the value of a, a RDP house. So that was the intention of the legislator to to exclude the RDP houses from from writing. Now these days, an RDP house will range well, maybe 80 or maybe up to 200,000. So, so that is a good example where the act should, should be updated. Um, another example is, is the serving of notices. Um, because the act says that, that uh, when a new valuation role is advertised, every owner must, must, be, must be notified, the so-called 49, section 49 notice. Um, and, and if you read it closely, it says it must be posted. And we all know the post office is not, is not, not functional anymore. So, so that is another area where the act should, um, should, should be updated to, to keep track with, with, with modern uh, trends. Now, so, but then I think the fact that it's market, the basis, the basis of valuation is market very that's solid. Um, and, and I don't believe that should be changed. But there, there may be a few of the smaller th things, and, and I think this whole issue of the reviews, when, when of an objection, the values change by more than ten percent, is a review process. That is, that is not really working. Uh, we're sitting in Joburg with, we're still dealing with the previous valuation roles appeals, and and that's now five years down the line, uh, or more than five years down the line, and and, and that that I don't think that should be addressed. In, in, in updates of the legislation. Well, perhaps I can keep you busy for, but, but I think that might be the, <laughs> might, yeah. might be the more important uh, things that comes to mind. Perhaps you've opened the door for us to have a round table at some point to really kind of unpack this act because it has such a, yeah. it plays such a pivotal role in every property owner's life. It's it's kind of fun, it's central to how we how we pay our councils. Thank okay. you, Ben. Thank you very much for. Uh, for being here, for presenting. Obviously, if you have any questions, I see some questions have come through, maybe place them in the comment section. We are gonna to come to these questions at the end of the, se end of the session. Um, we are now going to move over to our next speaker, uh, Micah Gold. And as I introduced her earlier, she is a partner at Schindler's Attorneys. Micah currently works in the property law department, which specializes in disputes with various municipalities due to incorrect billing on a variety of issues and a large array of administrative law matters. Furthermore, Micah has been involved in numerous neighbor disputes, which sounds interesting, caused by non-compliance of the various building and property bylaws set up by the municipalities. I can imagine that uh, is, is an incredibly painful process. So, Micah, now, what I obviously get from your resume is that you 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 specialize in objecting and if necessary taking a municipality court. I'm going to I'm going to ask you to provide some insights into the objection process in a moment, but let me ask you this, and I think just to kind of so everyone sees how where everything fits in. At what point does a property owner switch from only engaging with a valuer to approaching a law firm to go to the next step? So look, it's very much a personal decision because most valuers like Ben um, do the objection processes for their clients as well. So um, the, the only time that I would suggest 100% rather approaching a um, law firm rather than a, a valuer, no offense to the valuers, is when the issue in question is the category of the property and not so much the value. Um, 
because as you said, any aspect of evaluation has a huge impact on your, your rands and cents amount that you pay to the municipality. Um, so the value is super important, but the category is just as important because if you are valued um, at, a, at, at a fair amount, but your category is incorrect, let's say, for example, you live in a residential property, but your category has been set as being a business property, you'll be paying up to four times more for your rates than you would be um, if it was on the residential category. So um, the, the category issues very often become more of a legal nitty gritty, um, which is where a lawyer that specializes in this kind of thing can become very helpful. So we do work very, very closely with a lot of valuers where they do the valuation aspect and we do the, the, the category aspect. Um, because obviously I'm not a valuer, so for me to go to the municipality and argue about your value is not going to be the best idea because it's not within my area of speciality. But um, when we, you know, when we get involved in categories, uh, it gets it gets very legally technical very quickly, and um, we have a number of matters now where we've been successful in um, the valuations appeal board, for example, and the city has then decided to review that decision in court. So it, it helps to have someone that has, you know, the, the, the background knowledge of all of the legislation and all of the policies that come into play in this um, to be able to assist in that regard. And Michael, when should someone object? Is there kind of a threshold where, where you advise perhaps clients that come through and you, they ask you about potentially going through an objection process? It, do you have any kind of advice that you give them? Um, I would say object. Well, if you want to get professionals involved, then you need to do a value call. You need to work out, you know, if let's say your property has been overvalued by 10%, what is the, the, the monetary value of that going to be over the four to five year period or three year period, depending on how long each municipality has its roles open. Um, and then, you know, do a value call. Is the cost of getting someone to help me to do this worth the actual cost of what I'll be saving? Because it doesn't help to throw good money after bad. Um, so there isn't really a threshold because every property is so very different. So a 3% difference for a residential property will, might be negligible, but for a business property, 3% could be a huge difference. So um, it, they, I can't really give you a general threshold number, um, but it's a personal, again, it's a personal call um, for anyone, you know, that is wanting to object. Um, but obviously, like we've, we've seen valuations uh, where the, the overvaluation is more than 400%. So then obviously it's definitely worth it. Um, so it's just, it's just a value call in most of these instances. But that doesn't mean that you have to wait and have to approach a uh, professional to assist you. You can also do these objections on your own. And then obviously it'll be for free. It's interesting that you use the 10%. Uh, the so if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, that, that actually leads to an automatic assessment, if I'm not correct. Yes. And, um, but if, uh, uh, and just... Correct me here, you still should object in any event, even if it's going to automatic objection, correct? So, um, okay, so it's a different, that's, okay, so the 10% rule comes into play once you've actually lodged your objection. And if you're successful with your outcome and the value of the outcome increases or decreases by more than 10%, that's when a section 52 review process comes into play, which Ben was speaking about earlier. Where I mean, on the old general valuation rule, we're still dealing with appeals, so we haven't even gotten to the reviews yet. Um, we generally do advise our clients in instances where there is a differentiation of more than 10% to do an appeal, which we call a locus, um, locus appeal, just to confirm the value as it was per the objection outcome so that you don't go to the automatic review process. Because in an automatic review process, you as the consumer don't have the right, in most municipalities, I'm not saying in all municipalities, but in most municipalities, you do not have the right to make representations. Whereas in, in the appeal process, which is the same board that makes the decision on the review, um, you do have the right to make representations. And if they confirm the value on the appeal role, then it doesn't go on the automatic review process. So you can stand comfortably with the confirmation that that is going to be the value of your property for the subsistence of the role. I think that really kind of dovetails with the theme of today, getting people involved regardless, just making sure you're engaged, making sure you have a full understanding of what's going on. Um, so then following on from what Ben was explaining about the GVR, let, let's let's move to the next step here. 
A municipality must publish a notice that a GBR is open for public comment. What I have noticed is there is generally no no kind of time frame for this process. And, and I mean, that's just from a layman's approach. They often look like they're open for a month, some are two months, some are three months, depending on municipalities. Uh, can you give us some kind of idea of what how, how long is the process, the objection period? So there is legislatively no specific time period that a role has to be open for inspection and for objection. Um, the municipality gets to set that, and most municipalities set it depending on how big their role is. So, for example, in Joburg with the 2023 GBR, we got confirmation that there was about 956,000 properties on the role. And I'm sure the people that reside in Joburg are aware that they eventually actually ended up extending the time period within which you could do the objections. It was originally set for some time in April, and then they extended it to um, the beginning of May. So they realized that they didn't give the public enough time to consider everything, get their evidence together and do the necessary objections. Um, so there isn't legislatively a specific time period within which the municipality has to give the public a um a chance to object but um yeah it's just something that you need to kind of pay attention to because they do have to publish that role um and like Ben said they have to snail mail you the notices but they do generally advertise it on the radio and that kind of thing as well so as long as you kind of pay attention to that you should have the necessary time to do the objections and every municipality obviously must provide an objection form, we would have made. Um, most of them do it through the websites. Other, other more disorganized municipalities, uh, as I've seen of recent on their notes, they say, please come pick it up from the office, um, which is an archaic way of doing it. But nevertheless, they, they, they're going through the motions and, um, and a property owner must also make sure they get the right form, if I'm not mistaken. They must certainly, if they, if they live on a farm, if, they, if it's a residential, if it's a business, and then, then they've obviously got to submit the objection. What and, and and I'd imagine you'd do something similar when you do an objection on behalf of a client. What should form part of that objection file when one submits it? So obviously you need to complete the form. That's first and foremost. If you're doing it on behalf of someone else, you need to show that you have the authority to do it on behalf of someone else. So you would need to, if it was for an individual, have a special power of attorney that authorizes you to be allowed to submit that objection on someone's behalf. And if it's um, if you're doing it in your own name, you don't need to be able to prove that you're, you're doing it in your own name. Um, if you're doing it on behalf of a company or a trust, you would need to get a resolution signed by them to allow you to do it on their behalf. So that would be the first annexure that I would attach. Then the next thing that I would attach is a proof of why you're saying that your property is incorrectly valued or incorrectly categorized. So I know in municipalities like in Cape Town, they've completely um, forbidden or said that they will not consider objections where you use automated valuation uh, processes to prove that the value of your property is incorrect. So like a light stone or a, um, a wind deed, or um, I know the f &B app also, I think, has a has a function where you can get valuations done on the app. So Cape Town has said that they won't accept or they'll reject valuations that have that kind of evidence. So the the you know obviously the amount that you're looking at objecting let's say the property is valued at 10 million rand and it should be valued at 2 million rand we're talking about a really large difference there so you need want to get the best evidence that you can to show that the property has been overvalued by 8 million rand in that instance i would highly suggest approaching a valuer to actually come out to the property to do a valuation for you to show that the the, the property value has been completely overstated you can also approach um, estate agents to do valuations for you, but the weight of that that kind of valuation carries is a lot less than that of a valuer. So we generally tell our clients, look, the best evidence that you can use is the um, is to get an actual valuer to come do uh, an inspection of the property. But let's say, I mean, we had a client a couple of years ago that had a property in Papenburg Bay. And it was a very unique property. It was an absolutely beautiful uh, 10 bedroom house, but it was built on top of a um, natural spring. And they had to install a whole bunch of different things in the house in order to make sure that the water that kept seeping up from the natural spring was able to be pumped out. And, you know, it was it was a whole process and it obviously added to the electricity costs and that kind of stuff. And that wouldn't be, you know, something that a valuer, like a, a municipal valuer would be aware of when they come to look at the property just from the outside or if they look on it on Google Maps or whatever the situation is in that instance. 
Um, so we did a whole report for them to explain, you know, the, the, the natural spring and the measures that had to be taken and that 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 would have had an impact on the value of their property. And we were able to get the value of the property decreased because of those factors. So let's say you, you have an example where a building has been hijacked or your build, your house is next to a house that's been hijacked. I know in, in Malville, in Joburg, that's quite a, you know, it happens quite a lot. And then that you're living next to this decrepit house that's been stripped of all of their windows and everything. And that's obviously going to have a massive impact on the value of your house. So if it's that kind of thing, you can yourself, you know, take photos of the um, the factors that you believe have an impact on your your the value of your house, and you can submit that to the municipality. Just make sure that you pr present the necessary evidence to show what would be um, considered to have a devaluing factor on your property. And the same with a category. I mean, if you've been categorized as a business, but you're actually a residential, take photos of your house and say like, look, here's a bedroom. This is where I sleep. <laughs> it's residential. It's not business. Um, so each matter will have its own kind of, you know, um, factors to take into consideration, but attach as much evidence as you can and the weightiest evidence that you can. And like I said, for the purposes of evaluation, a valuer's report is going to carry the most weight. Um, if you do want to get an estate agent out to come and do your um, valuation of your property, I would suggest that you get a minimum of three different estate agents out and that you use the aggregate value, value between the three um, estate agents reports as kind of your set value, just to show you that it, you know, it wasn't someone that could have been influenced by you or something like that that could have set the value that the that specific estate agent gave. So after the objection process, we know it goes to an appeals process. Um, I'm going to ask you just to explain a little bit about that, but also in that explanation, there's quite extensive time frames that exist in all of this. Maybe you can just touch on those time frames that people must be prepared to take on. Okay, so like you said, with the like we said with the objection process, there aren't specific timelines. You just have to at least have your objection submitted before the end of the objection timeline. So um, if you miss that, there is another process that you can follow that I'll explain in a little bit. Um, but it, I always joke with my clients with valuations situations. It's a hurry up and wait situation. You have very, very, very short timelines to do everything in, and then you sit and you wait for the municipality to come back to you with your outcome or with your evaluations appeal date. But let's say you've done the objection, you um, got your objection outcome. On your objection outcome, in most municipalities, they will tell you the date by which you have to submit your appeal. It's generally within a 30 day time period of the objection outcome being published. So like I said, it's a hurry up and wait situation because sometimes you can wait up to a year to get your objection outcome and then you have 30 days within which to do your appeal. Um, but if you miss the appeal date, then you would almost have to start the process from scratch again um, because that you, you missed your timeline. In some municipalities, um, well, in terms of the NPRA, you can ask the municipality to give you an extension. Um, the minister has the authority to be able to do that, but in most municipalities, they are not willing to give you an extension. So the only time that you could potentially argue that is if you didn't get your uh, objection outcome. Sometimes they post it to the incorrect address or you know it, it just doesn't end up in your hands. Uh, then you would need to be able to prove to the municipality that they posted it to the incorrect address and that's why you weren't in receipt, in it, receipt of it in time. And you, you, you began to lead into, I think was my next question, is you've missed the objection period completely. Uh, those days that you've missed the appeals process, whichever one you've missed, you've missed one of them. And now what we're going into is that you, you still want to make the objection. And from what I gather, the law does allow for this. It does. So we call it a Section 78 query. So essentially, you um, different municipalities have different ways of doing this. Um, most of them have a set form that you have to complete. So you complete the form and you say, um, I'm, this is the reason why I would like my property to be placed onto the next supplementary valuation role. So during the subsistence of the general valuation role, at least once a year, a municipality will publish what is called a supplementary valuation role. So that is generally for properties where the nature of the property has changed during subsistence of the valuation role. But that doesn't mean that you can't use it for your own benefit if you missed the objection time period. 
So, um, and the act is specifically set up this way. So you complete the section 78 query form that the municipality has. If they don't have one, then you can do a letter to the valuations department setting out that you have a query um, and that you would like your property to be placed onto the next value supplementary valuation role. And then you need to wait and pay careful attention to the um, municipalities' websites and any kind of publish publishings where um, they announced that that valuation roles are available. I can give a big up to Rates Watch on that. They are very good at keeping that information updated on their website. And I know Jonathan, you told me this morning that uh, Can will also be putting that onto their website. So they are going to be easy platforms for you to be able to find out when the valuation roles for your specific municipalities will be available. Um, and once that that supplementary valuation role is um, published, then you can follow the objection process on that role. And if you're successful, then the decrease in the valuation of your property should become applicable to the beginning of the valuation role and not only from the beginning of the supplementary valuation role. Micah, let's let's look at the worst case scenario now. You've uh, you've gone through your appeal process, you're right at the end, you'll be told you're nothing's happening. What what are, what you've ticked every box, dotted every R across universities, what's the next step? What can a law firm like yours do at, at, that, at that point? So if you're access, unsuccessful in the appeals hearing, so you've done your um, appeal, you got your appeal hearing date, you went and made representations in the appeal hearing and the Valuations Appeal Board still did not find that you, you were correct in your valuation or your dispute, the only option available to you is to take the decision of the Valuations Appeal Board on review in the High Court. So you would do it in terms of what we call the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, so PAJA, um, and you would basically ask the court to review the decision of the Valuations Appeal Board um, and replace it with its own decision or refer it back to the Valuations Appeal Board for a decision again. Um, the only stipulation with regard to that is it has to be done within a 180-day period of the Valuation Appeal Board's uh, outcome being made available to you. So it's not an infinite amount of time that you have within which to make the decision to take that uh, to court. So, um, but if you do miss the 180 day time period, you can request a condemnation from the court. It's just a lot more difficult. It makes, it adds an extra layer to your case that you don't really want to have to argue. Yeah, I'd imagine you do this when there are exceptional values attached to a property. I think that's a judgment yes. call. And um, yeah, and I think what pe most people will ask you if they came and, and asked for a brief on this, they'll say, well, how often do you, how often does one win? Um, so I have thus far not been unsuccessful against a municipality in court, um, touch wood. <laughs> um, but I mean, you never know. There's so many factors that are at play um, that you you can't you you can never know. Um, at the end of the day, it rely, you know it, it ends up being the judge's decision. And if you haven't convinced the judge with sufficient evidence that your case is a good enough case to make a decision on, then you you might lose. So the chances of success will depend on the attorney that you brief, whether they know what they're talking about, and your case. Like that's ninety percent of the your chances of success re rely on your case. If you you know if you want to review a decision by the Valuations Appeal Board, you better have some very good evidence to show that the Valuation Appeal Board's decision was incorrect. Thanks, Micah. Thank you very much for for your inputs there. Um... We, we Jonathan, I just remembered a very important point. Sorry. Yes. Um, just so just to qualify, the Section 78 uh, query process is not open indefinitely. It is only open for so long as the role subsists. So let's say, for example, in Joburg, we're busy with the 2023 general valuation role. By the time that the municipality opens and publishes its next valuation role, which will probably be in 2028, because Joburg likes doing the roles every five years, um, if you haven't done the objection process it, within the five-year period that the role was open, you will not be able to object to the role again because the municipalities are of the view that a role closes as soon as a new role opens. So it's not an indefinite, you know, 
thing that you have open to yourself that you can object to the valuation role at any time you have to do it within the subsistence of the role if you miss that five-year time period and they believe me there are a lot of people that do miss that five-year time period the only option available to you is to actually go to court to review the decision of the municipal valuer on the role that you have an issue with thank you thank you very much for that clarification thanks Micah we, we are we're going to head over to the, the questions for now and uh we're just gonna we've got we've got we've got a good 10 10 15 minutes to get through these so uh and i i'd imagine some of these questions are these top questions are probably going to be for ben but i can see let me see i've got some for and we've got some for my as here so i think ben should valuations in an area or suburb not follow the market trend for the area i i, I would think ben has to some extent answered this but Ben, perhaps you want to just come on board again and just say, just kind of give a, a brief on shouldn't the valuations in an area suburb follow the market trends for the area? Just give some kind of context definitely, there. Definitely. That, that is because the basis is market value. It's, it follows and it typically on residential properties, um, what the, how the, the, the prices of that houses are selling for in that area will, will, um, in, Will it will have will uh, it will, um, inform the, the value of your property because uh, typically, if, especially if it's a homogeneous area, all the houses are similar, uh, small changes. Then, then those sales will typically give you a very good indication of of the, the value of your your property. So that is what the value should aim for because that's why you, you, they they must do a market analysis of the of, of the analysis of the market. Um, when when they when they populate the model, and Ben, I think this is a good follow up question to that particular one. What is regarded as an acceptable deviation between municipal valuation and the valuations reflected in actual sales? Uh, there, there there are a few schools, and I think the the international valuation standards have mm -hmm. indicated sort of percentages. Um, and 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 I think up to 10, 15 percent in some cases can be acceptable. But the the, the 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 deviation speaks to the accuracy of the valuation. So if you if you value a block of of, of, of offices, it, it's it's much easier to determine the market rentals for the office space and the expenses. So, so to, to have an accurate valuation on on, on an office block. Is, is, is much easier than on a on a house and and maybe that that house Michael referred to in in Peterbach Bay. If you have a unique property, it's very difficult to 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 provide an accurate valuation because you don't have a lot of market information. So so there is a link to the accuracy and the amount of market information that's available. But we would normally say if if it's within five percent. Then, then, we, then it's very difficult to to uh, to challenge that value. But if, if it's above five percent, and you put you have good market evidence, then uh, you, you can go for it. So, uh, yeah. So the other day I had a, a reduction in the value of of a, over a million rand of the house, but the value was only reduced by fifty thousand. So that is a joke, uh, because you can't be that accurate. You can't value to the nearest fifty thousand on a, a million rand house. Uh, so, so sometimes the guys take it too far. Yeah, that 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 seems grossly unfair. And I think, and I'm going to keep you just on for one other question here, Ben. Um, when 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 a private assessor assesses your property um, with reference to the overall market and do they do they look at your location as an instance or do they only really look at like that they've got a great chrome gate swimming pool thatched roof do they only look at or are they tunnel vision only at your property no no obviously the, the tunnel vision is, is what do you find on the property so that's the value forming attributes of the property that, that gate and that swimming pool and that not the nice law park but then then you must take off the blinkers and say what's happening in 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 that area um, to influence yeah, and that is where location you know location 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 um, if if it's if the property is located on a busy road for instance then it can be detrimental to the value but if it's on a good quiet street then the value may be higher so location is is, is crucial 
And I'd imagine being on a busy road, but with a business address, that's actually, that's probably a positive to your yeah, yeah, evaluation. Sure. It, it depends on traffic. the type of property. Yeah, for, for, yeah. A, for the shopping center, you don't want to sit in the bush without good <laughs> access. But maybe for, for your home, you want to sit in the bush. So so you there are horses for courses. So every property type must be analyzed and see what's, what, what are uh, impacting on, on, on the value. I think this is a question for Micah. Um, hi, my complex is being built on business tariffs. So, in other words, their, their their property is being has been categorized as a business, but of course, there it's a residential. So, Micah, is where's the process to resolve this matter? So, um, this is they're being built for business electricity. So, I think. Before you um, make the decision on whether or not you want to actually be moved onto the residential tariff, it would be worth doing a assessment of whether or not it is actually cheaper to be on a residential tariff. Um, the process to to resolve that is in terms of the, um, um, the the credit control policy of each individual municipality. I see this is COJ. Um, so that would be section 16 of their credit control policy. So you would need to log, log a query with their call center, give them 60 days to respond. Um, you would then need to do a letter of written complaint to the municipality itself. And if they don't comply, give you a response within 30 days, then you can go uh, do a letter of appeal to the municipal manager. And if you then don't get a response within 30 days, you can approach the ombud or you can go to court to have your issue resolved. But it would be a good idea to first do a value assessment of whether or not it actually it would be cheaper. Because if you're on the LPU tariff, very often it ends up being cheaper to be on the LPU tariff. If it's a very big body corporate, then it would be to be on the residential tariff. So that's definitely something that we can assist you with. Um, if you want to... Um, Samantha will be sharing our, our details at the end of this, I think. So um, if you need some assistance with that for your body corporate, that's definitely something we can assist you with. Great, thank you. And I'm going to keep you on, Micah, for this. For the, is the question that's come through. How do I get my refund? My The, the valuation has been changed. My objection has been listened to. And I think this is probably, I, I don't know which particular municipality this is in, but uh, is there a process to get your refund, or is that I, I know with me in particular when I got mine, it was just it was just pretty much credited to my bill, and I got this fantastically low bill one month, which I loved, um, and then I got back to normal again. But that, that, is there any other process? So most municipalities have a policy that they don't pay out credits on an account while the account is still active. So, so long as you still own the account and the municipality is lawfully entitled to bill you on that account, they will not pay out the credit. The only time we've been able to kind of get them to deviate from that is if we have a court order. Um, but essentially, you won't get a refund from the municipality, you would just get a credit pass on your account um, that you can then use up by means of not paying your account until that credit is used up. Thank you. And I think this is either both a question, there's a last question here, and I think it's worth, worth asking. Um, ballpark figure of costs of getting professional assistance with an objection. And uh, is it where, what kind of outlay are people looking at if they go this route? So um, we charge a set fee of 3,500 Rand, excluding VAT, to do an objection, and then the same charge to do an appeal. Um, but that was obviously not including any of the evidence that you need in order to prove the value of your property. So um, Ben can probably give you a better indication of what a, the a, you know a professional value as services would cost, um, and perhaps what they charge to do objections and appeals for clients. Yeah, and Ben, would you be able to give us an idea of kind of the cost that a person would uh, incur in getting professional assistance? So. Um... We we saw we have a sliding a sliding scale and and there's one for residential properties and, and another for the non-residential. So on on the low end, I think it's up to about sort of five million rand. If you if you go up to an appeal, the total cost can be I think around six thousand rand plus back. So um, it's um, actually if people are interested, they can they can contact us for a for a quotation. So it's because. It Often it's 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 a bit dangerous to give give out general fees, <laughs> Mike. You would know because then they say oh, you say three and a half thousand, so that's it. But but, but often the, the costs run up. Um, so the, the safest is to 
is to um, request a, a quotation and then take it from there. Yeah, I, I agree on that. I think it's obviously wise for people to look at quotations and to really allow their the professional assisting them to get a good assessment of what that particular property is like. As we know, you might have a spring and a pump underneath it. Um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This, is, this has been an informative session. I think um, Ben, Micah, you've been you've been you've been really great in explaining things. I think we've all learned a lot. I'm certainly I'm certainly leaving this session having feeling like I, I know a lot more about about this particular aspect. Um, and we hope to have you on again. I, I do think this this subject requires continuous discussion, and there are many many more avenues for us to to go down. Um, so without further ado, we are two minutes out from six o'clock or seven o'clock. Uh, I think it was good evenings to, to get to. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for attending. This video will be posted to our site. Our link is in the chat. Please see it. That'll take you to our uh, resources section where we deal specifically with GVR. You'll see the municipalities that we are current. We have a list of that are active. We have done our best to provide links to all of them. Please take a look through them. And, and we have also got a link to Lightstone in there where you'll able to get a automated uh, report if you want. But of course, as, as you've heard, there's nothing better than some professional assistance when you need it. So please obviously get hold of professionals when and if required. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and we will chat soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.